here. Our masterclass today is focusing on our, the need, on, on the, the reason why we need to work with men so that we can achieve gender equality for our women. And uh, when I was thinking about it, when I was preparing, like I've been thinking about it and preparing for the last one week, I was wondering, like, why do we need to engage men? And uh, I know that uh, there's a lot of talk uh, lately, and this maybe started like maybe around five or six years ago, about the need to, to engage men. It's been there, but it has caught a lot of traction lately. And uh, it's because of the realization that uh, men are an integral part of our community. They are here with us. They are the other part of the G. So, and without working closely with men, it is very, very hard to add violence against women. Because again, as I keep on saying that, we have a lot of uh, venues, big and small, which engage women, which bring women to the table to talk about their issues and various things, whereas we don't have a lot of spaces for men. So, our calling today, this, this evening, is to see how can we work with men because we need to add, we need to bring to an end um, violence against women and uh, sexual and gender based violence and all other forms of violence uh, which are flipped, which are directed to women by men. We are conscious of the fact that uh, GBV, sexual and gender based violence, is prevalent and it affects at least 91% of our women. And the first, the first majority of the perpetrators are men and uh, so there's all the need to work with men and uh, this also th this need or this realization has also dawned on other major organizations like the united nations they have seen that uh, the reason why violence against women keeps on increasing and it is not adding is because we have forgotten men and boys to bring them to the table and to discuss and to talk to have a conversation as to why this is very very important and this is another thing i, I was in a meeting uh, 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 virtually, I was attending um, that was on Tuesday, and someone was saying uh, something we you know, but maybe sometimes we don't think a lot about it. That men, they are our brothers, they are our husbands, they are our friends, they are our sons, you know. And but why? Why, why all this violence? Why do we have, why, why have, has it been so, so difficult to have this conversation and to bring men to the table so that we can talk on ways of how we can aid gender-based violence and, uh, ex and especially sexual and um, sexual violence against women and girls. So looking from that perspective, I want us to, today we have our speakers, we have Dr. Uma al Kadri who will be joining us now, I think, in the next 15 or so minutes, because he just asked for some permission a few minutes ago. And uh, we also have NG Dara to drive this uh, master class forward, and I'll also be speaking. And uh, so my role today is, um, is, is as a speaker and, uh, and, and, and also as, um, as, a, as, a, as a facilitator, someone to bring, to, to, to bring the other speakers in and also to encourage our questions and answers. And uh, so like, um, so we are going to start to, to start and uh, I am going to bring in Ejid Dara uh, to tell us why it is important to talk, uh, to, 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 to engage men, why it is important to work with men, to aid violence against women and also to achieve gender equality. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Caroline, for this uh, brief introduction. Uh, why is it important to uh, engage men in uh, trying to achieve uh, gender equality. I always say this, uh, and I said it before in one of the meetings of uh, Akidwa. Uh, I remember back in 2007, I, I was trying to provoke Salome and uh, asking her consistently the question, why are you not uh, uh, working with men in, in Akidwa? And her reaction was all the time, no, 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 no. <laughs> we cannot work with men. And uh, I said, well, one day I'm sure you will approach men. And in 2011, uh, Salome approached me and uh, said, well, Ejid, can you uh, start working with men, engaging men in our work? Uh, we want you. I said, well, this is the time really. Uh, 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 and it was timely uh, way to engage men. So when I started working with men, uh, my question, as, 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 as uh, uh, um, you've just asked uh, Caroline, 
why is it important to engage men where it's about women, where it's about women trying to strive for equality and to position them, themselves better. And before that, the narrative all the time was, well, women coming together really to start defending themselves, positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis of violence uh, to which they were subjected uh, from men power. But um, unfortunately, uh, one can notice that uh, sometimes it's, it works better for women themselves, within themselves, but uh, you can well discuss about equality, have all the theories, how to defend yourself, but whenever you go home and you face uh, the man in the house or even other men in the street, the, the, the story is different. So men, uh, since they, um, they, they do not wish to change, uh, it is difficult to achieve equality uh, between men and women. Uh, tonight, I want really to approach this subject from a migration uh, perspective. Um, since Akidwa is not only working on uh, equality for women and men or gender-based violence for women in the world, but uh, Akidwa uh, tried to focus, uh, tried to focus on migrant women. So whenever there is inequality between men and women and, and women in the world, when it comes to migration, it becomes also problematic. And this is something that we need to look at uh, how migration uh, impacts uh, on gender. And this is where we can also see the pattern becomes a little bit different when it comes to migration. And this is, I, 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 I reckon it's the, the framework uh, uh, on which we, we need really to discuss uh, tonight. So tonight for myself, and uh, I want to speak really from experience. I did a bit of work with Akidwa. Uh, since 2011, I, I, did, I carried a lot of uh, uh, workshop uh, with men uh, in direct provision centers, but also men in the community uh, to discuss about the issues of gender-based violence. Uh, I also um, did a research on uh, female genital mutilation with Akidwa, and I worked on migrant democratic participation I also contributed to the, the policy on uh, sexual harassment uh, with, uh, of which Akidwa was uh, one of the organizations with the Department of Justice and all the policies in direct provision centers, I was part of it. And myself, I'm very much involved on uh, working with women through my organization, uh, Wezesha. Uh, we do a lot of work in Africa uh, with Salome. Um, I traveled. Uh, I traveled quite a lot to different places in Africa, and uh, recently I traveled to Goma, that's the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, where women were really subjected to uh, rape and uh, atrocious violences. Uh, so I'm going to speak from that perspective, and I'm currently doing a bit of research on the education, and this is my area. And formally, also I worked with Stirasi. Uh, on education, and this is really my area, and the most of my uh, uh, students were women, and also Muslim women, and for, it's from that, that experience that I'm going to speak. Now, gender, gender discourse is not only a new concept in migrant communities, specifically to Africans and to some extent Middle East, Asians, but also a challenging, a challenging narrative that the majority of them are not yet ready to integrate in their lives because of being deeply rooted in uh, patriarchal cultures. So a lot of people, uh, when we come here, we do value our culture and which we always take for granted. And uh, talking about uh, gender uh, and especially when addressing men, it becomes quite challenging because these are the concepts that uh, in most of the places do not exist. We just leave, as Caroline said earlier, as brothers and sisters, husband, and especially in the African culture, leave out the, the, the event of a colonization. When you look at the time, okay, the, the traditional Africa, 
there was no kind of incidence of gender as such. Men and women, they were living together. Uh, they were completing each other. And uh, even in, uh, at the time of, um, well, in the, in the society, the community, uh, men and women, they were, uh, the roles were distributed according to how we perceive life in the, the community, in the society, and people were living peacefully. So, and uh, the colonization, I don't want to be, to go deep into this, uh, came up with some also um, considerations, for example, involving people into formal education where men we were privileged because probably they need in the market. Uh, so men started occupying, uh, uh, going to formal education where they could achieve a higher education, whereas where women were disadvantaged and men were started taking it for granted because they are the one who um, were possessing the majority of means and uh, um, uh, women were kind of occupying a kind of lower position within the society. The hegemony of male sex over the female is in fact taken for granted for many who originate from this continent, Africa and Asia. Women and girls in these migrant communities suffer a huge disadvantage in the human development and are often left beyond in the Western society. So you can look at it, women, when they come here, even girls, because those who, for example, did not benefit from formal education, when they come to, to live in Europe, in the Western countries where you need kind of basic education, of course, you will be disadvantaged because you may not be able to access uh, good employment, or you may not have the language ability that will really allow you uh, to access good employment. I've seen, I saw that with, uh, for example, the majority of uh, Muslim women, especially from Somalia, uh, who were my students, they were struggling with English. The majority of them uh, did not have any form of formal education. You cannot expe expect these people in the Western context to uh, occupy a privileged position in the society. And when it comes to racism and social uh, discrimination, they are even further dis uh, victimized. As a migrant myself, I've I piloted a range of projects in support of migrants in general, and I have witnessed and addressed gender inequality from an employment approach, approach and different, at different levels. Before I describe how I implement a gender perspective in my practice in the field of migration, I would like first to state that promoting equality between men and women is a bitter pill for migrant men. Yet, living in Europe for migrant women offers an opportunity to enjoy equal rights and access to resources that they wouldn't have in countries of origin. However, Adopting the principle of equality between men and women as strongly dictated by policies in Europe remains a big challenge for both migrant men and women. What are the issues? Discussing on gender, Moza, one of the, the, the thinkers, I like the fact that gender is often related to satisfying needs, which are different according to roles that males and males and females play in the society. Often women's, uh, women's needs are defined in relation to the domestic and reproductive roles, which unfortunately perpetuate gender inequality. Now, even in Akidwa, uh, most of the time we work on reproductive health or whatever. And uh, when men, they look at that to say, wait, 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 yes, this is really for women. You need to learn about reproductive health. You need to learn about this. This is, you must be limited to your role there and that's it. So when we're talking about uh, roles, uh, they are 
most of the time roles that are related to, well, that's what women should do, that's you know, what men should do. We do not do, go to what I call strategic role as such that would promote equality between the two genders. This should shift into uh, focalizing more on addressing strategic needs that consist of women's empowerment. And this is really key, uh, even uh, with, uh, on my work with Wazesha, and Wazesha itself means uh, empowerment. Because we believe that by empowering women, women can achieve equality or gender equality. Uh, empowerment, which will help to overcome the subordinate position, working on a vision of the future where inequalities be, uh, between men and women will no longer exist. The notion of fulfilling needs in gender discourse becomes complex when working with migrant men and women from deeply rooted patriarchal uh, societies. Below some of the issues I have identified and which have since informed my approaches in ad 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 addressing gender inequality. In general, migration issues such as traumatic experience in uh, the country of origin, frustration during travel where death, risk, and abuse may have occurred, not having the language of country of migration, thus limiting access to services and resources, loss of confidence and self-esteem caused by racism, discrimination, and lack of cultural ad adaptation, etc., may affect men to an extent that they become frustrated and feel loss of power. Reacting to that, they tend to use the dominating power over women within their homes and communities, thus increasing incidence of domestic and gender-based violence under various forms, including rape of adult and young girls, especially in refugee camps and asylum centers. The reason why I was by Akidwa to work with, uh, one of the reasons I was brought by Akidwa to work with uh, men in direct provision centers because that time there were a lot of incidences of uh, harassment by uh, not necessarily rape, but a lot of incidences of harassment uh, in direct provision centers. Um, um, a lot of men, uh, single men, even married men, uh, trying to harass uh, girls in direct provision centers or other women who are single or, or married. So uh, most most of the time, it's because of the level of frustration that people go through and uh, they don't feel that power. They have lost power. So how will I exercise my power? So I would have to look for people who are, that I see that are weaker than myself so that I can show that I have the power. So women in migration, okay. And we've seen that even in IOM. My own work is it's in IOM. Uh, in most of the... Uh, refugee camps where people are displaced or whatever, these kind of uh, incidences are quite frequent because men who have, uh, who have gone through a difficult time and they feel themselves that they have reduced, they have, they, have, they have lost some forms of their masculinity. So to regain that power, they will exercise a form of violence over women. Even though women experience the same migration challenges, but with further difficulties due to their female position, living in Europe offers them a great opportunity to have access to resources that enable them to claim autonomy vis-a-vis -vis of the dominating uh, male partners. When I work with men in addressing violence against women, they complain that their wives have become very arrogant because they have the right to perceive and manage children allowance given by the state and that women are also overprotected by the state officials, social welfare, uh, social workers, police, police. 
we in one of the in, in most of the, the the focus group discussions that I had made with men, a lot of them really could show the frustration how uh, they felt that women uh, in migration or women in Europe they have given a lot of powers because uh, one of the reasons uh, if there is any disputes between a man and women and the police comes it's always and they don't even uh, allow the man to speak they will. Um, I mean, uh, uh, try to prioritize the woman. And most of the time, they, if they, the, the situation is quite serious, they will even ask the man to leave the house and leave the house to the woman. So men started, start feeling very frustrated in the context of Europe and they becoming very angry. And that really positioned them to violence somehow. And women also have access to resources. A lot of we have seen a, a lot of cases where uh, women believe that, well, they have the right to manage the child benefit and men should not uh, uh, touch even that money, even the social welfare, especially in families where uh, none of them is working. And they were, they are even couples that have separated because of the dispute of a child benefit and men showed uh, a lot of forms of violence or, or, or over that. Women are aware that if they complain to the official over the maltreatment by their male partners, official will ask the partner to leave the house to the wife who will then enjoy freedom and full management of the household income. For men, this is a kind of revenge, which they find very challenging. Yet the women, the woman, uh, it, uh, for the woman, it is cert certainly an opportunity to access right to which they were always being denied in the countries of origin. However, it is curious to note that in such situations, men become more, more frustrated and would wait for an opportunity to revenge in order to fulfill the male ego, either by becoming dangerously aggressive or running away to keep up their pride. Stories of migrant husbands murdering their wives are not unusual. Or some migrant men going back to their countries of origin and leaving wives and children alone in Europe. Why, why, while alone, majority of migrant women struggle to negotiate independence, leaving despite the fact that the state manages to uh, meet their needs. So it becomes really uh, a difficult situation where uh, men, because they feel frustrated, uh, it's either they, they will use violence and most of the men have seen that, especially a lot of African men, they, they, they decided to go back to Africa because they don't want to face humiliation. They say uh, where it's the woman now who has the power, who uh, is directing things. But at the same time, because especially in the African culture where we think that men and women, it's about uh, complementarity. Women, when they are left alone, they, sometimes it's difficult for them to manage themselves. So they try to, um, to rely on other men who at the end of the day, they start abusing them as well, uh, taking advantage on, on them. So the situations become also difficult for the woman. This is uh, where it becomes important to understand that in gender discourse, the notion of strategic need is paramount. Fulfilling gender strategic needs is the only way of addressing gender equality. And this is how I have been bringing gender, a gender perspective in my daily practice in the field of migration. Empowerment approach as strategy to addressing gender inequality. What does it mean? If the immediate situation solutions as described above in addressing violence against women in migration field are not sustainable, a more strategic solution must be sought in order to protect women and promote a more effective and efficient gender equality. In seeking to reach migrant women's autonomy and assist them to enjoy equal rights, education programs that take in account the specific sociocultural 
and migration context must be considered. For example, I piloted uh, ESO, uh, ESO English for speaking of other languages, uh, classes for specifically vulnerable migrants uh, and torture survivors, uh, where specific modules such as life skills targeted women, including group of Muslim women, helping them to explore and discuss the experiences and how to face challenging issues in the country of residence. I always uh, like giving that example, uh, 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 the group of uh, Muslim women who were my students. At the beginning when they were coming to the class and they were all covered up, covered up uh, they could not approach me because they, the people who were facilitating the classes were also uh, women. And uh, so I started approaching them as a man uh, differently uh, with my own strategy, uh, showing to them that I was not uh, an enemy. I was a man who was there really to support. And uh, with the time, these women, not only they started shaking my hand to say hello to me, but they started hugging me. And I found it quite fascinating. Um, so helping them to explore and discuss the experience in, and how to face challenging issues in the country of Israel. Education is therefore a very strong empowering tool that helps to question, to question stereotypes and thus accessing freedom. By becoming able to speak the language of the country of residence, women cease to depend on their husband or other males in the community for service, service access and also life skills modules equipped them with more confidence and self-esteem in uh, as they became able to challenge and address treatment that victimized and subordinated them. So what the empowerment approach here is really not only focusing on what will be the role of the woman, but what a human person needs to be in self of to be herself. Uh, we saw it in the ancient time, for example, when the colonizers came, women could not access education. And that really subordinated women only to uh, the work of the domestic work in the house. And yet a, a woman who is educated, who has attended uh, the same education as a man, can also uh, fulfill uh, or occupy a greater position. And that automatically will leverage uh, 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 equality uh, between men and women. Now implementing, uh, let's now go back to men, implementing a gender perspective working with men in, is the most challenging as they tend to resist change. Again, my approach is the education tool using Freire, Paulo Freire conscientization concept. Conscientization or critical consciousness is the way Freire frames his educational theory grounded in post-Marxist theory and that focuses in achieving an in-depth uh, understanding of the world, allowing the perception and exposure of social and political contradictions. What does it mean? An informal setting of men's gathering is facilitated by a man. So I organize that focus group where it's, first of all, I am a man. You cannot bring men who are already resistant to change, who takes it for granted that, well, women uh, are inferior to us and a woman going to challenge men, they will not even listen to her. I, I remember when uh, all the focus group that I, I, I facilitated with the men, the, the first question they were asking me, are you a man or a woman? Sorry, Ajid, please start summing up now. Yes, because for them, it's, it was not possible for a man to start challenging those uh, uh, kind of uh, things that they take for granted. 
This ethical component is important in Freire's pedag pedagogical theory. The focus group discussion would consist of helping participants to think critically, understanding that gender is socially constructed and that equality between men and women is rather natural and the norm for a peaceful society. For example, in my focus group gatherings, often men allege that men's superiority over women is natural and indeed supported by religious and cultural norms. And this is how boys and girls are brought up to believe, a reality that no one can change. First, is it, is it, it, it is striking to see that it is a man who challenges such concept. This can only attract, first of all, attention. Why a man coming to challenge this? and yet is a man. Trust and indeed insight to discussion. The second thing is to call upon to the participant to question their belief by deconstructing what is natural, what is religion, what is culture. Through dialogues, participants finally uh, come to the, con the conclusion that naturally human beings, regardless of the color of the skin, the sex, age, etc., are all equal, and that for political reasons, society have built norms that unfortunately have become truth. This approach has been very successful as it impacts very positively on men's action. Most importantly, sust sustainable, peaceful behavior that they adopt is not supported by obeying to policies. Or, or regulations that protect women, but rather a new self formulation and adoption of the concept that generate new belief. I since have been using the same approach even in discussing gender with women, including in Africa. So we cannot only rely on the fact that the police or regulations will punish uh, men, it is important that men themselves, they start deconstructing all the conceptual uh, uh, framework, all the concepts that we have uh, on equality or superiority that men have uh, over women. In that regard, uh, policies or regulations will become no longer important because then we will, be, we will build a, a new frame, a conceptual framework on our relationship with men, women, and uh, start considering them as equal partners. That's uh, how uh, my modest contribution. And uh, thanks very much for listening to me. I will be very open to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ejid. And it's true, regulations and laws may not end up helping our men a lot without having a deeper conversation uh, to challenge their behavior. And um, though I'm sure in some situations they will need a lot of help. So now our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uma al Kadri, is the head of Klonsky Mosque and also Islamic Cultural Center. Welcome, Dr. Uma, and share with us, please. Thank you. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much. Uh, very good evening to everybody. Um, I am Dr. Umar al Kadri. Uh, I am the head imam and the chief imam of the Islamic Center in Ireland. Uh, not the Klonsky Mosque. Uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, I think probably a mistake there. Uh, but I am also the chair of the Irish Muslim Peace and Integration Council. And it is a pleasure for me to be here with you tonight, this evening, uh, to celebrate the 20th year of anniversary of uh, Akidwa uh, and to participate in this uh, very important discussion. First of all, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Akidwa for all the work that you have done in the past two decades, uh, particularly uh, the work the, the, the work of uh, promoting uh, justice, promoting equality of women in the larger society, uh, particularly migrant women. Um, at the same time, um, those that are not aware, we in the Irish Muslim Council and the Islamic Center of Ireland, a couple of years ago, I believe 2017 or 18, uh, we uh, spoke uh, very uh, vocally against uh, FGM. We highlighted the uh, Islamic position uh, that this is absolutely unacceptable, 
um, and it has no foundation whatsoever in uh, the Islamic faith. Uh, and all those people that are uh, engaged in this, uh, in this uh, practice uh, do so, uh, they, they, are, they, are not, they cannot justify this in any way, neither from a religious and neither from a cultural perspective. Um, and, and this is how I came then in contact with uh, Dr. Caroline Monyi, and I participated in a few other uh, events of Akidua as well. Um, I just want to share some of my thoughts today. We've listened to a very comprehensive, um, uh, you know, speech and talk by um, uh, Egide Dalla, um, if I pronounce that right. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it was very, it was very thought provoking. Uh, thank you very much. You mentioned a couple of things, and um, I, I'll try to, uh, you know, give my thoughts on that. But, but first and foremost, as a man, uh, I, I stand with uh, the work that you do. Uh, I stand with the work that Akidwa does to promote equality, promote justice uh, of migrant women in Ireland and abroad. And I think the important thing for men is to listen to women. This is why I am here. You know, I, I would like to listen to, uh, to, to, you, to you, your stories, and uh, even though the purpose of today's event is actually to listen to men uh, because when it comes to toxic masculinity uh, it is no undoubtedly that men also you know they they suffer from it they 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 are they, they are one not, not only uh, are they perpetrators when it comes to uh, you know violence and other issues they also are victims themselves uh, and and this whole idea the need to aggressively com you know compete and and dominate uh, as a man in the society is uh, very harmful for 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 men and not just women um so so um i as a man you know personally i look at the way i was brought up the way you know our culture is uh, my parents come from a Pakistan, from Pakistan. Uh, the Pakistani culture is not too different than the Nigerian or the African culture. It's in many ways when it comes to um, the the role of men, it's very similar. Um, and what is expected to be from men, it's very very similar in 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 those regions of the world. Um, and I think um, traditionally, even Muslim societies, uh, fathers. Uh, they have, for example, I mean, have always remained distant from their children. You know, the, the father figure is somebody that children, uh, they are very reluctant to speak to dad. They're reluctant to mention something to, to, to dad. Um, they would, you know, talk to mother, to mom. But when it comes to dad, the personality or the upbringing is done in a way that fathers remain very distant. And that has obviously changed with the current generation. Uh, but I think that uh, it is really unfair to fathers as well, that fathers ha are expected to be this very, you know, serious, angry, always aggressive, or always uh, very, you know, um, a person that does not communicate with the children. Because see, communicating, for example, with children and listening to children, asking them for their input is seen as, seen as something that is probably weak, um, is, is really problematic. But we do find that in, in these, you know, um, cultures. And uh, I have personally, for example, tried to obviously change that when it comes to upbringing of my children, you know, try to be there. Uh, when it comes to, um, you know, not all the emotional burden of being a parent shouldn't be on the women alone. It should be on both parents. It shouldn't be only on the mother. So to share that, uh, to be a person that actually, you know, communicates with children uh, is not always, the, you know, the person that um, is like in our culture is a very angry and very you know serious person always um, where, where children can come and they can share and they can talk and even um, when we look at the way of uh, I mean the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him uh, which is an inspiration for 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 people that are faith you know in the Islamic faith and it's very unfortunate that people even though they are Muslim do not necessarily follow the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad Prophet Muhammad himself you know there is no for example tradition where we see that he had um, he had stipulated the role of women to be confined to home to children etc he didn't do so at all and there was there was no such um, stipulation um, in fact regarding treating women um, you know with 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 uh, kindness and in fact making sure that they have their own independent 
uh, you know, right and independent say in things and matters. He highlighted that uh, in we find, for example, the the right to acquire property, the right to uh, to vote, for example, participate in public life, uh, in politics. Uh, we find that in 1400 years ago in the life of the Prophet Muhammad. And it's really sad that some societies that happen to be Muslim, they have really forgotten this, this legacy. Um, so fr from my perspective, there is a, men should be feminists. You know, in, in my view, um, the men, it, it, you should be, if you are a practicing Muslim, at least, and if you think that the Prophet Muhammad is your role model, uh, I always say to my congregation and to the uh, communities that I speak to uh, that, listen, you should be feminists. Uh, it's actually a, a religious role and obligation of us to, to, to allow women to think for themselves, to allow women to make their own decisions. I mean, who are we when God had created both men and women with, uh, with intellect and with free will? Who are we to, for example, decide um, as men what the role of women is in societies? I mean, that's not our job. That's that let them decide for themselves. I mean, it's their lives and they have this independent, uh, you know, intellect and they have the free will to do so. Um, and also, I think um, women do not owe men feminism. You know, women do not have a duty to owe that to men. It's the duty of men to be feminists uh, and men have to really take time to listen. I think that's something that is not happening sufficient, is not happening enough. Um, we need really honest conversations. I mean, when um, today um, during uh, the speech, uh, Mr. Aguida Dalla mentioned, for example, how some men are uh, victims because of, you know, in the Western society, you have uh, women uh, that, for example, governments or the, the authorities, law enforcement agencies will deal if a complaint comes to them straight away in a manner that will that will kind of you know protect the women uh, and somehow neglect um, the, the 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 men um, and without actually first you know investigating the matter and this has been and is i have come across this in my uh, dealings in the past 18 years on a number of occasions where men have actually really been victim of this uh, of of a system where um, they have been just because they're men they, they are expected to be the ones that are perpetrators, which is not always right. I mean, um, you know, we, men can be victims also. Um, and so there needs to be really honest conversations in that from, from both perspectives, from, from all aspects. Uh, and men have to take time to listen to women. At the same time, women need to listen. And and I am thankful to Akiudwa for providing this opportunity uh, for, for, for us to come and speak about these, these issues. And without communication between us, um, between migrant men and migrant women and very open conversations, and you, you are providing a platform for that, which is really required. I think we will not be able to really grant justice and equality to, uh, to women, but also to men in the society. So once again, the reason for me to be here is to listen. So I look forward to everybody else's opinions and views today. And I will then uh, go back to my community and feed that back to them. So thank you very much. Jazakumullah khair. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Dr. Uma. Very, very important. You've said men should be feminists. And you said this is Islamic men, Muslim. No, no, no. Me, I'm saying all men should be feminists. And uh, why should men be feminists? Actually, now I am coming in, I'm swimming in, I'm introducing myself and also my literal talk about this. Uh, because today I'm wearing two hats. And why should men be feminists? Men should be feminists, actually, even for their own sake, to save themselves. Actually, not for women, just for themselves. And uh, I'll come to that later, like why men should be feminists. When Ejid was speaking, he said something about power. And even you, Dr. Omar, you've touched on that, men's power. And why, why, what power and which power are you talking about? Because it's true, there's power. Sometimes it's real, other times it's imagined. And um, this power, it comes from what we call what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man. And those are the gendered roles and those are constructions of the society. Those are societal constructions and I hope I'm not get, I'll not get academic at all. And um, so when you look even from my own community where I come from in Kenya, what it means to be a woman, it means uh, cooking, cleaning, fetching water, looking for firewood, cleaning babies, 
uh, looking after her husband, looking after anybody who is in the compound, and that, that person maybe is a grandmother, grandfather, visitors, when they come, it's a woman's job. And what does it, that is just a small chink of it. And then what does it mean to be a man? In most communities, now we're talking about the patriarchy, which Ejid has touched on, and you also, Dr. Uma. And um, a man is expected to go out there, look for money, if it's kettle, go and grease the kettle and bring something home for everybody to eat. So he's a provider and a protector. That is his role. And so you can see that what a woman does is more inward facing. Whereas what a man does, what it means to be a woman, it, 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 in, it, it has like roles which are more outward facing. So whatever it's supposed to do to fulfill is a protection and providing he has to, it is more outward facing. And so by just that, what he does is viewed as more prestigious, even in his mind, it is, that is more prestigious. And I'll tell you a ritual story. When I was very, very small, and I'm sure Salome knows this, and even those participants who are here from, uh, who come from Africa, there's a small game we play called Kati. And uh, that is where uh, we, we, and we also call it Chamama and Chababa. And that means small children will go and the children would play games like I am mom and you your dad. And um, I remember I was playing that game um, with my neighbor's son and other children. So I was the mother and my neighbor's son was the dad. And so I was being told like, so he was talking to me like a father, now what he sees his father doing and he was behaving like what I see my mother doing. And everything was going well. I had my children there, my younger brothers, his younger brothers and sisters, all, all those who are my children. They were supposed to do what I was telling them and I was making food made of soil. And uh, everything was going seemingly well until I said that, um, that I, I, something I, I said, I want to, to be a lorry driver. He stopped being a father. He stopped being a father. And I think I was only six or five and he was like you can't drive a lorry you can't do that and then i was like you can't because women do not do that and seriously the game and it was a child's game it all came to an end and i have never forgotten now he's all grown with his own family he has never forgotten and we laugh about it i know that time it was a game and it was annoying when the game came to an end and went to go to our to a mother's house her houses prematurely but why I've given you that little story is to show you how ingrained, how ingrained these gender draws are, even in the minds of little children, very small children, that it is, you are a mother, you're supposed to do this. You cannot drive a lorry, even don't even talk about it. And me, I'm a father, because I'm a man, I'm done supposed to do that. So, because you can also see the prestige which is attached to that being a lorry driver and then you're there driving 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 there's some element of prestige and then a woman you you go you you, you go there and then your work is to wait for the lorry driver to bring the meat to bring everything and then for you to cook but now things have started changing and why are they changing because now a woman doesn't need to wait for a lorry driver anymore even she can drive it even she can drive a Dublin bus. And so it means that she will not sit down and wait for someone to bring the meat, to bring the shopping, to bring clothes for the children, to do the, to provide other things like, uh, even for her own self, because she can go and work. And that has become problematic. And uh, that has become a source of many, a lot of, a lot of unhappiness in many homes and in many relationships. And it's also become, it has also become something scary when many men, think about it. And even you can see also some women, it's so affecting them, like even some communities, like even women, girls are being told, like, don't do that. You cannot become an engineer, but just try to be maybe a teacher, a social worker, or, um, or something like um, a nurse that is more that is more friend rate, it's more, it, it will suit you like when you get married, because if you become this, you're going to scare men and men will not marry you. Because again, those prestigious roles, being a solicitor and near a doctor it is seen as a preserve for men again coming from that gendered socialization that socialization of those norms and so what do we do Ejid talked about deconstruction and that is a very very good word and a very powerful word so how do we go about deconstructing because why because we need men to end gender-based violence to end sexual and gender-based violence we need them on board 
So here we are talking about deconstructing, that is undoing, undoing. So now you can imagine, let's start just imagining the men we've talked about who are coming from the global south, who have been socialized, that as a man, what you do, even who you are, you, what you do is prestigious. And that's even the way you walk, the way you do everything. And then women's work is more inferior and it is more inward facing, cleaning babies, cooking, doing that, doing that. It's not, I just said like, it's not going to be easy work and it is not easy work at all. And that is the fact of the matter. And I remember also both speakers have, 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 have touched on um, like the way men are treated uh, by law enforcers, by the judges and everybody. And also this saying that women are overprotected. Is that true or not true? I don't know, but I'll say something for us to judge whether this is true or not. Because when this woman goes maybe in, in, in the presence of, that, of a judge, I'm sure the judge uses human rights approach to look at it, to look at a situation. Mostly it's the woman maybe who has two or three children to look after. And so the house, she cannot be told to leave her own home. So it's someone else maybe who does not have a lot of baggage, who does not have a lot, who, who does not have children to look after. And uh, so, so some of some of those things again, I want to say they are looked at from a from from a human rights perspective, and uh, and then and then the law takes its course, and um, and then so, so so like that 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 issue of women have more rights, and also even in communities where we are coming from, uh, you see that even here the same story applies. And I said this before when I when I, when I, when I came in, that um, women, when you look at all those. Um, conventions, you, you, even start from U Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there are specific laws which speak to the plight of women and girls. And why is this? Again, it's because of those disadvantages, those vulnerabilities, because of a woman, because of her culture, the gendered roles, again, to impact. And then on top of that, other issues like FGM, to make her even more even more sat on, if I'm going to use that word, come into play and other harmful cultural practices to keep her in place, in that gendered place. And so I want to say that um, when we do that, actually when men do that, it's not a sign of power. If you have to, like if I am running and you have to tell me that I need to stop so that you can catch me and then overtake me, no, no, no. We, it, we need an even key we need we, we need something we need a good starting point where we are equals and then we start but if you have to if my legs have to be cut when i am running so that i don't go further than you that is not good because although we don't have time because we can also go into why like a practice like fgm and other cultural practices why actually they don't work for men at all but uh, it's a sign of weakness and uh, so those are some of the things. So that, that is why we need like, uh, to have these conversations. And even, even maybe as we deconstruct, look at even what we are calling power. Is it power really? Is it power? And, um, and, and, and also men, uh, to look at men, we said, uh, when, when we started, we said men are our husbands, they are our friends, they are our brothers, they are our sons. When you look at that woman, maybe the one, the woman who is being subjected to sexual violence, rapes, rape, and other uh, and other atrocities, why don't we? Why why can't men look at that woman as somebody who has people as well? I'm just trying now to appeal to something who has a father, a brother who love her just the way you love your own friends if you don't have a sister you love your own friends who are women or your own sisters or your mother and then you just think about that that someone as well like uh, maybe that man who here maybe a sister was hurt and i uh, think about it and 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 and, and feel bad and um and something along those lines um because it's about also feelings and uh, so the deconstruction the deconstruction that that is going to be a lot of work and it is not something which can be done even cosmetic at in a cosmetic manner it has to be to be very, very, um, very, very in depth because men, as Dr. Uma said, and I'm going to emphasize this, men should be feminists, even not just not just even for women, but for them, even to save themselves, to save themselves, men should be feminists. And so we are going to continue this conversation, and um, that is what um, I, I I needed to 
evening and uh, we are going to have uh, questions now uh, coming from our participants. Thank you very much. So let's start having the questions coming. Alana? Hi, Caroline. Yeah, um, we have a few questions coming in on the chat. Yes. I think we might just start. There have been a few comments. Mm -hmm. But I think we might just start with one general question um, yes. that we had. Um, all of the speakers have talked about um, the need to engage them and how they um, how how there needs to be awareness there. But how do we go about creating that awareness when they don't when men don't think that they need to be engaged? Yeah. Um, how do we go about creating that awareness when men do not think they need to be engaged? That's a very good question, Alana. And um, I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll give something very brief and maybe Ejid or Dr. Uma can come in. Uh, remember, we have said that uh, why men need to be engaged in this, um, to be again to end gender-based violence and sexual, viol sexual violence is actually for themselves, is for themselves. And even we've seen like even how these forms of violence, how they contribute to poverty, how they contribute to poor mental health outcomes, not just to the women who are on the receiving end most of the time, but also for the perpetrator. So, there is need to have this conversation and engage them and find and also work on strategies. Ajit mentioned uh, Paulo Freire, some of the Freire methodologies of concertizing, concertizing men are very, very good. And I know this, that is not something I can go into right now, but there are ways they'll take time because you have to be you have to be patient because like another thing i like saying like when you're working with communities because now it will involve now also going to the community and educating people and also and learning and learning those, those some of those things people learned a long time ago that this is the right way to do things because of my man and then you can imagine now and doing that from the mind and this is something we, we, we discuss all the time with rodrigue because rodrigue works with men and uh, we, we work together but in fact, that some people, even some organizations, they expect that when someone goes to the community, that is going to be like, you just talk, 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 and then you are out of there and you have achieved, you have achieved an impact. And also find some things also very problematic, uh, like some of the reporting uh, criteria that within one year you're supposed, maybe people have changed their minds about this. It doesn't work like that. And we all know that change is very, very difficult. So we need maybe to revisit some of these things, have, a, have, have more in-depth conversations on how to do these things. And, um, and also like to put in place, uh, like even, even funding and other strategies which will make us achieve more, la more long lasting and in-depth change like we are, than, than we are currently seeing or witnessing and in the hope that we reduce violence against women and girls and especially sexual and gender-based violence and um and uh, this, 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 this will entail, and also like, uh, also like respecting, being, being respectful uh, to people and uh, to practitioners, to development practitioners who, who, who go out there, who analyze situations, and they're like, this is what needs to be done here to achieve results. And uh, so, like, uh, I think that there's a lot of work to be done at all levels, even not just on men, Alana. So, thank you very much, and maybe Ajid and uh, and Dr. Uma can chip in. Thank you. Yeah, just very briefly, uh, why uh, would men, if they don't think that they should be engaged? First of all, let me tell you as a man, uh, I think if they don't, they, they are the losers. Uh, my strongest hobby is I like observing animals in the wild field. I'm always amazed when you look at the hunters, the lions, the hunters are not the male lions, it's the female. Yeah. Uh, so female, <laughs> Women are actually the strongest gender. If men do not engage, they are the ones who are going to suffer. Because 
uh, women are capable of everything. They are capable of generating uh, resources, uh, having income, everything. Especially like in Africa, we go work with uh, people in poverty situation where men don't have uh, formal employment anymore. So it's they are women. women are the ones who are working on small income generating activities. So if women are educated to stand for themselves and men do not have anything, and if they don't want to engage, women will stand for themselves and men are going to lose. I went to do research with women and I was shocked the way women were saying, uh, men, uh, I hate them. I don't want even to hear anything about my husband. They are useless. So they could say to me very easily and they teachers who work with them are men, they were so shocked how women were not telling them all those things, but they could express themselves very easily for, to me. They said, why are they so comfortable with you? I say, well, I reflect a different energy because uh, even my attitude, I, I'm not, I don't have a dominant attitude. I position myself as equal vis-a-vis uh, -vis of them. So I create that space where they feel uh, really uh, uh, comfortable. When you look at it, even from uh, the migration perspective, men, if they do not want to engage, at the end of the day, still they are the ones who are going to suffer. In my expose, I, I explain uh, how uh, men are always, uh, I mean, uh, women are prioritized when it comes to uh, facing state authorities. So they are obliged to engage because at the end of the day, as I concluded, it will bring peace. It will bring peace between the couple. It will bring peace in the community. It's very important. They, they don't have any choice. They have to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ejid. And just wondering, Dr. Uma, do you have anything to add to that? Or we go to the next? No, that's fine. We can go to the next. Sorry, I, okay. we can go to the next, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Alana, maybe we can take maybe three questions and uh, then we answer them and uh, then like that. Um, yeah. If, yeah, and maybe you can also check if, whether there's anybody whose hand is raised. Yeah, uh, Lucia's hand is raised, so maybe we'll okay, ask yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to um, Hajid and Dr. Humar. Um, definitely insightful. Um, first, I just want to start with a comment. Um, um, it's actually sad to be here and to sit down and this, you know, panel is not, not at least 50% male, you know, for the title and everything else and the need that needs to be done. The, I have two questions for both and then maybe, you know, um, sorry, just one question, <laughs> one each. Um, Dr. Umar, one of the questions that I have is a what has the Muslim community has done to achieve, you know, uh, gender equality? You know, because of obviously, you know, of what we know of, of how, you know, the culture it is. And then Hajid, my question to you is this, um, you said men don't feel, um, don't feel power. So they harass women, you know, they, you know, to regain their mascul muscularity. So why, are we excusing, you know, instead of trying to find solution? That's my question. And then for both of you, um, the you know, the question that I would just would like to, you know, to end is this, um, how can we, you know, start to, um, I would say, educate, not to say re-educate, because re-educate is start all over again for what they have learned but actually from what they have been put into for the background, their knowledge, their culture, how can they, can we enlighten the men and see that like we as women, we are more acceptable, I believe, acceptable to the change and we adapt quicker in a way because it is, we are nearly forced to accept it. Male maybe because of um, ego or whatever it might be, it's a little bit harder because I, you know, in, in a way, you know, to me, I feel that it's more like, um, uh, imposter syndrome than anything else. So how can we, you know, pass on um, without, like, like, without having to to beg for men to be participant? We have young men in our community in Ireland that are suffering because the male participation in our community, you know, um, NGOs and and activities that we do are not being seen. Thank you. 
Thank okay, you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You might okay. Be to so I, I just start with uh, the question regarding what the Muslim community is doing. Uh, first of all, um, when we look at the Irish Muslim Aid and Integration Council, we have in all the Islamic centers and mosques that we uh, run or we influence in Ireland, we have asked everybody to make sure that uh, women should be in uh, in management roles. They should be uh, as spokespeople of the organizations. They should be involved in the running of the organizations. We organized uh, last year Eid in Croke Park. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure if you all know about this. This was one of the celebrations of Eid that uh, was very historic, took place in Croke Park. And if you had seen the coverage of it in RTE, you could see that the whole the whole event was basically uh, it was it was really you could see the equality you could see equally men and women participating leading the the prayers leading the whole Eid in Croke Park. And this year again we will be having Eid in Croke Park once again, um, and and we will be aim to do the same thing, um, you know, to make sure that uh, the participation of women uh, is, uh, is is at least you know similar to uh, to men uh, if not more. Um, now. Regarding the other question or the other um, question that, that uh, was, what can we do uh, to make sure that uh, men are more involved? Was that a question, if I understand rightly? Sorry, yes, I was nodding my head. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, exactly. What can be done to achieve, to be able to achieve uh, this partnership, you know, in, 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 in achieving um, gender equality? But again, it's about identifying uh, partners. We, we have men that are uh, heirs when it comes to feminism. We have men that uh, really are, uh, you know, passionate, uh, genuinely about it. it. It is, of course, challenging. The reason for that is because what some men will um, perceive this uh, as is uh, we have a leading role and someone is there to take our leadership away from us. And that is obviously, uh, you know, one of the biggest the, the barriers. Uh, but when you have men uh, that are all ears, they are, you know, perfect uh, partners uh, to engage with and to start some, some, you know, work on the grassroots level. Uh, and this could be in community centers, in churches, in mosques, um, in GAA clubs, etc where you have these um, you know, people from both genders involving in, um, you know, in organization, in the management of and not just communication, but also practical. I mean, what we need, really need is, it's not just about talking, it's about seeing equally uh, you know, um, in involvement from both genders in, in every part of the society. Okay. Um... Thanks very much, Dr. Umar. I, I just, for the, my part of the question, I'll try to, to be brief. First of all, I'm not trying to get kind of an excuse approach when I say that uh, men um, feel the loss of power, so they become frustrated and, and get angry and become aggressive. No, that's not my intention. This is, I'm describing, describing what is happening, okay? Uh, men, because they feel, that uh, they have lost power uh, uh, because of the perception that they have. So it's not trying to excuse men, but I'm describing uh, what is happening. So, uh, yeah, back Green chilies, okay? Green chilies, okay? Dr. Maya, okay. So uh, if then these men who feel the loss of power, they change the way of thinking, okay, in terms of equality of gender, they will not even feel the loss of power that, in terms of description. Now, how do we do it in, in the way to feel that men are, are, are committed? Um, yes, in a practical way, it's possible, but I think we need also to change the conception of the society. Uh, we need to frame things differently. The paradigm must change because when you look at it, almost all the society, it's something that is taken for granted that women are not equal to, to men. Even not only uh, in Africa, where we're talking about patriarchy culture. Here in Europe, it's even stronger, but it's, it's, it's kind of hidden uh, within uh, measures. But when it comes to practice, that's why you will see that men do not want to consider women as the equal. So if even it's that kind of concept, the paradigm change, 
you will see automatically uh, this will affect, uh, I love, it will affect uh, societal structures. And so in our societies, built in the way that, as I say, things are always taken for granted. I just want to give example of FGM, how it's so much taken for granted. And when you look at it, FGM, they are the strongest, the strongest advocate of FGM are not men, are women. Because that has been taught to women that, oh, this is something good for you. Even if men, they come to say, well, we don't want FGM, women will be practicing because they do not understand that this is a harmful practice. So they are women. And men who uh, came up with this practice, they tried to hide themselves. I was myself involved in the case of FGM where I was about to, I, I was uh, uh, um, appointed to, to work with a man who um, was involved in the FGM case. After a few sessions of education, that man said to me, if I knew you before, I think I would do things differently. And he said to me, you should talk to all the Muslim or Somalian men to understand this. So this tells that a lot of people are not exposed to that kind of uh, uh, awareness uh, that uh, we call conscientization. It's so important. And my conclusion to, to, to this was, how people explain FGM, they say, well, a man will not, and women now, they may not say it, but they will say that men will not marry you if you did not undergo FGM. So I question, I say, can we not do it differently? If today with all the young men, we start thinking things differently and with a very strong uh, kind of awareness education, and the young men, they start refusing to marry women who have undergone FGM because actually it's painful for them to have sexual intercourse with women who have undergone FGM. So if they come to know that, well, this is something it's, we, we cannot accept that, women will, will believe that for them to be married by men and men are refusing them because they undergone FGM, of course, they, they will stop the practice of, uh, of, of FGM naturally and uh, very simply. So we need to start uh, uh, thinking differently. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Ejid, uh, for, for, and, and Dr. Uma. I can see Dr. Uma wants to leave us this year. So thank you, Dr. Uma, as well, and uh, we'll be in touch. And uh, so I can see Stephanie's hand is up, and uh, maybe Stephanie, Alana can come in. Thank you. Yes, good evening, everyone. This is uh, Stephanie McDermott here. So thank you. It was really interesting, actually, to hear all of the... Sorry, that's my dog just starting to bark. <laughs> so, and she's a female, so maybe she wants to join. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting to hear the perspectives. Of course, we have to listen to men. Of course, we have to listen to men, you know, and we have to listen. We have to join men, I have to join in the conversation. But my question is really to the panel, um, and it's just something I observe, and I'm not sure um, if if I am correct in this at all. Um, I work with um, migrant communities, um, and I'm just wondering if the panel thinks that the preservation of culture and cultural practices transcend the kind of issues of equality um, in present day Ireland and take kind of precedence over equality. Um, so, for in, in for instance, you know, um, for some of the African communities, I know, um, you know, it it's almost an insult to say to a woman, a man might say to a woman, "Oh, you you are becoming Western now if she refuses to do something," um, and that's almost you know that's a stigma that you would become a Western woman um, because you have to hold on to your culture. So, I'm just wondering if if we're just at a, a kind of an evolving stage where the first generation of people who settle outside of their home place hold on to their culture much in a much stronger way. Um, and if that also means holding on to cultural practices, be that patriarchy or, you know, feeding the men first or whatever it is. And, and just, I have observed it, but I'm not sure how widespread that may be. And if I may even be incorrect in making that observation. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, do we have another question uh, that you can answer at least two or three of Stephanie's questions? Maybe it's a bit loaded, but we'll, 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 uh, we'll, uh, we'll unpack it. Do you have another question, Alana? Yeah, we do. Um, we have two questions. Would you like me to present yes, them? Yes, please. And we'll okay. note that you've edged. So from Michael Inoma, uh, we have what is currently being done towards educating both migrant women and men towards a stronger mutual respect mentality. One, giving real opportunities for migrant families to learn and grow. And two, for the young migrants to have relatable representation, key opinion leaders. So that's all? That's the first question. And then we also have one from Ivy. Uh -huh which has um, two parts. Um, how are mutual engagement and harvesting emotional intelligence and resilience with, within households being addressed? Also, how open are schools for real, not non-superficial cultural integration for younger elders of tomorrow? I can't really see migrants in schools. There are lots of professionals out there. Okay, please ask again the last bit. Um, for us it's just i think part of her comment to follow mm -hmm. up on the two-part question i can't really see migrants in schools there are lots of professionals out there okay yeah so uh, so we'll start uh, uh, answering those questions um ajit and i and um, and uh, we, um, i'll just touch a bit on the on stephanie's question about culture and um, people coming here and uh, holding on to their culture and the first generation. And also patriarchy, you mentioned that, and uh, I find that a big word. Because sometimes if we are trying to draw a picture of patriarchy, it is something seriously which might be a bit hard to draw or to, to put together. Because it's also like um, a package of practices which mirror somebody's um, cultural observances. And sometimes we don't talk about cultural practices. They are good cultural practices. And when we are doing those, um, the work we do with Rodrigue, we try to show that this is good. Because you cannot just go and start telling people that what you're doing is all wrong. You have to say, no, no, no. This, we have to draw a line and say, these are our cultural practices. These are good. This build us. This is something actually when we can teach people who come into contact with us. But these ones are harmful. Things like uh, FGM, early marriages, and, and other things things which um which which affect the, the the rights of people and uh, so like that's that that's something huge stephanie and um and 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 and, and so like um we cannot say that uh men or women are holding on uh, to or even maybe the children as they continue staying here they'll become they'll become less less attached to their culture which can be true because it happens because of what you call acculturation and it's also a long process but uh, with consequence but uh, there's need for education for need to have conversations uh, targeting men directly and to speak about the rights of women and as as we said earlier as the two speakers said why it is important for men to be to 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 to, to get engaged um in ending violence against women and so it would be important also like to look critical and that is something we do even at Akidwa uh, in Rodrigue's work, in my work, and also it's something we are trying to start maybe doing with the young migrant women to look at how, how can we deconstruct some of these uh, so, so, so what, what is not good, what is not building people so that, uh, so that we, 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 can, we can have equality. And so that, like, that, those, like that, that, that is important. That's a very good uh, question, Stephanie. Um, and, uh, and then there's also the affecting emotional intelligence in schools and how open our schools again. Again, this is also huge. Remember we said that it's going to be a process. It's not something like we are going to wake up in the morning uh, and, 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 and wake up in the morning and then start saying, now we are going to do this and then by evening or by the end of the week. No, it's going to be a long, long process. Uh, and uh, I hope that we do not lose the, we do not lose men and the boys uh, in the process. And uh, because deconstructing again, uh, what someone has always believed to be the right thing to start doing something differently, we said it is not like one of the easiest 
things. And also that takes care of our, about the need to educate migrant men and women so that they can learn and grow. We are all learning. We all, we are actually like, we need to open spaces uh, to, to learn and grow. Because I always say, if someone is working in development, uh, the most effective development workers are those ones who come into that space with the mentality of, I am in this journey of life, and as I'm on this journey of life, I have something to learn. People who come and then they are like, yes, we are here to teach them, right? to show them this or that. Seriously, it, it, it doesn't work like that. But with that open mind, educating each other to know where we are coming from and to know where we are in our personal journeys so that we can, we, we can all grow together. Because when there's that deeper understanding, we will be able to grow together to know how to be to understand more and uh, to ask questions more and uh, to, to to create those so that's why that's why in akido now we are creating those safe spaces for for conversations and we'll continue doing that and um and so maybe ajit you can come in thank you um thanks uh, very much caroline um touching on the culture very briefly um uh, culture it's a big word but at the same time tend to be an excuse uh, necessarily uh, uh, without people looking at it seriously. I just go uh, trying to challenge, okay, what is a culture? Uh, if uh, generally we say that this is a kind of set of norms and practices and the aim of culture when we talk about culture is really to, um, to regulate ways of living in the society, okay? Uh, how people live. And this is something, it's agreed norms and uh, 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 practices that and at the end of the day that should bring peace harmony and well-being in the society so is violence against women women is it something that will bring peace in the society or harmony of course not so how can it be part of culture beating a woman is it okay we can, can say that this is in my culture if women say blah, 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 i beat you and you a woman you are nothing you have to be there you have to be there. What kind of culture is that? This is an excuse. This is, of course, not. Uh, I don't see uh, any trace of culture like that. If there are some harmful practices such as FGM, and as I said, and uh, Caroline said, this needs to be deconstructed. It came from somewhere which people have started taking for granted. And that must be deconstructed through critical education where people start questioning, where did this come from? Why are we practicing it? What benefit is it, is it bringing into the society? So it's only through that process people will understand, well, this is certainly not part of our culture. It's something that came and that we have taken for granted and practicing without knowing uh, how it has been quite um, devastating for our community and our society and something that we need completely to, 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 to abandon. Um, in schools, uh, where uh, is that our migrants uh, thought about things in school or, or whatever? Well, this is something that can be very difficult. Uh, we cannot, first, first of all, uh, the curriculum, the education curriculum cannot be only directed to migrants or whatever. It's a curriculum, education curriculum must be a, a general for everybody, uh, taking into account uh, diversity where people are coming from a uh, uh, different uh, cultural uh, uh, background or whatever. And we are working with uh, the Department of Justice uh, because we are, we, uh, we are trying to implement the decade of people of African descent so that they start trying to embed within the, the education curriculum some of the aspects that will address issues uh, that migrants are facing uh, to start uh, creating kind of balance in the society. Yes, this is something, uh, I will take this more as a comment rather than a question. Yes, it is important that uh, at the at education level, they started uh, looking at all those aspects because um, we people pass on some practices uh, very um, spontaneously uh, in, in their families. I would educate my children or pass on some of the, the, the belief that I take for granted to my children. Yet, if they are challenged at a, a school level, uh, especially uh, things that are harmful, um, I think uh, this can start also uh, creating some 
uh, questioning in our children. And we, as well as community leaders, we have um, the duty of uh, uh, raising or trying to uh, set up kind of community education at the level of our community. And I think this is the work of Akiba. This is what Akiba has been doing. And this is uh, what I did a lot with men and in DP centers. Yeah, and thank you very, very much, Ejid. And I want us to wrap this now. We, I, I want us to end our evening because this was a, it's normal. It normally takes a one hour, and now it's uh, it's going to it's I think twenty eight minutes to eight. So not unless Alana, we have one small burning question, and uh, then we'll call it an evening. Um, no, I think there was just a clarification from Stephen. Um, yes saying that I believe Ivy refers to the 99% of teachers being oh, yeah. Yeah. actually I think, I'm sure it's more than 99% of teachers mm -hmm. so again the need for representation um, also to create more more equality we've also been talking about that uh, that there's need to have migrants as who are working in various professions, and uh, so that so, so that we can be we can be able to, even it's also, it's also important for children to to see people who look like them working in schools, in hospitals, and in other spaces. And that, that's why like for us Akidwa now, we are working very closely with the, with, with the Black therapists of Ireland for our women who need counseling. And um, so like, I'm sure this is an example other organizations can, can take from us and so what i want to say is i uh, like thank you very very much for coming for our master class this evening and i hope you really did enjoy it and uh, thank you for the questions and more so for listening and for being so so um, beautifully engaged and um, so maybe not unless um if alana maybe has an, an announcement and uh, then we then, then we head off yeah, we just have a couple of upcoming events um, this week on Wednesday. We will have a storytelling event um, directed towards young people. Um, it's a youth and FGM event and it will be on from 7 o'clock on Wednesday the 16th. Um, so we have Eventbrite information that will circulate afterwards if you'd like to share with any young people that you know who might be interested in coming along, that would be fantastic. Um, and then we have another event um, to mark the day of International Day for the Elimin Elimination of Sexual Violence and Conflict. And uh, that will be on Saturday, the 19th of June in collaboration with Rosacea. Um, so feel free to sign up on Eventbrite for that as well. And we'll also circulate that information. Okay. Thank you, Alana. So, and uh, so thank you so much. And uh, we call it an evening and good night and uh, until next time. And so please uh, come to our next event, come to come on to our next events. And uh, yeah, we all learn together. Thank you. Bye.